We're brought here today by the love that Sarah and David share for each other. We're going to be so happy. We'll be so happy. I'm going to crush it being a husband. Happy anniversary, babe. Good to you coming here. It's been an amazing year. It sure has. <laughs> you did gifts on your anniversary? Why did nobody tell me this? Did he forget my gift? Quick, say something. I also ordered you a gift. It has not gotten here yet. <laughs> I have a feeling you know what it is. I mean, I've been hitting pretty heavily. Absolutely no idea. So, um, there's been something I've been wanting to talk to you about. Uh-oh. She caught me using the decorative soaps again. Have you, uh, thought about us having a baby? Kids, we just got married. Are you serious? Uh, I can't create a human. Yep, he's totally freaking out right now. Uh, crying, mess, noise, poop. Lots of poop. Honey. Yes. <laughs> what? Um, I'm ready to think about ha having the kind How do you open your gifts? Okay. <laughs> You're pregnant? Yeah, I'm so pregnant. Um, like how much? Like 100%. Oh. Like all the way pregnant. <laughs> it's gonna be a boy. He's gonna be awesome. He's gonna play football. It's gonna be a girl. She's gonna be my best friend. I'm gonna teach him how to build stuff. She's gonna do ballet. Throw stuff. Shopping. Break stuff. Theater. Burn stuff. Mommy's little princess. He's gonna be my little buddy. We're having a baby. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're gonna crush parenting. I'm gonna crush it at being a dad. Cheers. <laughs> um, yeah, this is going to need to be decaf. Is that a... Is that a pregnant? <laughs> All right, so we're going to miss that couple, I'm sure. They have some fun escapades. I'm not really sure what happened to the audio uh, this time on that. But anyway, <clears throat> so we are concluding this series called You, Me, and Eternity. And uh, this series has been, again, primarily about our relationships. And from the beginning, what we have talked about through this is um, <clears throat> this point, a couple questions or a couple statements that we've made. And those statements happen to be, pardon me as I move this, those statements happen to be falling in love requires a pulse Staying in love requires a plan. And so if you can check your pulse for a minute, just indulge me, then, hey, you got what it takes to fall in love, which we know, right? But falling in or staying in love requires a plan. And that begged us to ask the question of whose plan? Whose plan are we supposed to follow? Whose plan are we going to follow so that we can figure out how to stay in our committed relationships? Because you know there's a lot of things in life right now that are distractions pulling you away from commitments and pulling you away from promises and pulling you away from the very things that, that you want to do, right? But it just seems like, as Paul even writes in Romans, I just don't know why I can't do the things that I want to do. And the reason that we can, what we found is that our, t our plan and, and the way that we do things is often temporary, while God's plan, we find, is eternal. What God says to be true is true for all times, for all ages, for all generations. But for us, what we have to worry about is this big mess over here, right? We've talked about this from the beginning, that when we enter into relationships, what we bring with us is this big box of my hopes, my dreams, and my desires. And every single one of us have them, a box full of hopes, dreams, and desires. And then my hopes, dreams, and desires is what we bring in and we eventually find somebody. And when we say, I do, we don't really say it out loud, but when we say I do, it's kind of like, I do choose you to fulfill my hopes, my dreams, and my desires. Go ahead and throw that up there. And those front little words on this, my hopes, dreams, and desires, is all uh, indicative of what the problem is. It's my hopes and my dreams and my desires. And then you bring yours in, or Lacey brought hers into our relationship, and she has her own my hopes, my dreams, and my desires. And this can create a mess. It can create us to respond to each other in ways that we know are unhealthy. And so we need to learn what the plan is, what God has put in place. And here's what we've learned so far as we conclude this. We've learned first what love says. What does love say and what does love expect of us? And we read from the Apostle Paul and he said, therefore follow the example of God, God who is love. What did God do? He sent Jesus Christ to die for our sins. And so love says, you owe me nothing. And this is how we approach God in this, in this fact that God, you owe me nothing, God. But even in owing me nothing, I'm going to choose to live my life as though I owe you everything because I do. Owe you everything. God is the one. But love requires us to act this way in general in all relationships, in all interactions with people. Again, even if you're not married, 
These are how our relationships are supposed to function. Because when you look at this then between a person and a person, it comes out like this, which was part two of mutual submission. And mutual submission taught that we choose to place ourselves under the mission God has planned for our marriage because Paul writes to us that we are to submit to one another out of reverence for our awesome husband. No. Yes? (laughs) Submit to one another out of reverence for your awesome wife. No. We submit to one another out of our reverence for Jesus Christ. It's out of our reverence for God and God's plan through Christ for our lives. That is the ultimate goal and ultimate mission. That is the ultimate function of all things that we participate in because Jesus is at the epicenter of all things for us as Christ followers. And so when we choose to collectively, the two of us, the the two of you, to submit yourself to Christ and to God's plan, his mission, sub mission under this mission of God and you humbly come to him in this submission this surrender and say God my life is yours and then your spouse comes alongside and says God my life is yours then God is able to shape and mold and make this marriage work the way God wants it to work and it's not all about my hopes and my dreams and my desires but in fact what we find is it's about the dreams and desires or the hope if you will of God it's his plan of what he wants for you and It's so wild that if two people will actually surrender, and I say that because I've experienced this so much in in my tenure as pastor here, so much of that if people will surrender, what they'll actually find at the end of the day is where they think that they weren't after the same things that they actually were, they just got everything else mixed up and it created such a tension and such a gap that they didn't know where to go. And a lot of times it's in that, that tension that we have to surrender all the things that we think we know all the things that we think we should do and say, God, what is it that you ultimately would want me to do? And through that, God will create the way for two people perhaps that are so distant to be brought back together. We submit to this in all areas of our life and things go well because we're trying to live within the will of the Father. Now, what happens though when we don't? Because let's face it, I'm not perfect and neither are you. And that's where we talked about the ideal versus what's real, right? What's real in our lives. When we said this, that when we find that we're living in such a way or we've done things in such a way that it doesn't match what God says the ideal is, we never abandon the ideal. You never abandon God's ideal. But in fact, what you do is embrace God's ideal for marriage, for life, for any area of life, and you allow that ideal situation that may not be your reality. You allow the ideal situation to inform and to influence your reality, your present situation, and you become faithful. You remain faithful to God in all things, and you let God sort things out because I promise you, because Scripture says that it's true, and so many authors of Scripture said that it's true, that the Spirit of God will lead you in the direction that you need to go, and he'll lead you in righteousness and holiness, and you don't have to question that. And so we never abandon God's ideal. We embrace it. We do not abandon it to make ourselves feel better about what is real in our lives, right? We don't want to ever do that, embrace what's real versus what's ideal, because that's a problem. And you don't ever want to try to resolve this tension, because that might mean the elimination of things in life that that you have no power to eliminate, that only God does. And so that's a, a bad situation that the Israelites found themselves in as we talked about that. Then two weeks ago, we talked about communication. And this was a big one for a lot of you. I had a lot of response from this from you. As we talked about the words that we use, and we talked about the words that we use have weight, and that words aren't equally weighted. That negative words weigh much, much heavier than positive words. And that who the person is speaking the words, in fact, the weight is not the same. And in your life, you experience this all the time through the words that you use. So we read from the Apostle Paul, and he said to make sure that the words we use are only used to build other people up. And with that, we can all raise our hand and say guilty as charged, right? Guilty as charged. Our words are only supposed to build people up. It's supposed to be for their benefit, and it's supposed to meet their need, not your own. And I know what we say. We're like, yeah, but they need to hear what I have to say, right? That's their need, but that's not their need. Their need is to hear, perhaps, but it's not the way that you want to be heard, and it's not the way that they want to be told, and so we have to be careful because you've experienced this before. We can go to people and just say, hey, I'm just, I'm just being honest, right? I'm just speaking the truth, and you can batter people to death with truth and honesty. And Scripture teaches Christians that you have to be careful with those words because they have the power of life and they have the power of death. And so when we speak truth, when we speak honesty, we have to speak it in love and with grace. We have to be tender. 
Because it's exactly how you want people to deal with you, and it's exactly how all of us want God to deal with all of us. Right? Amen? Exactly. Then last week, we talked about humility. We said adding with this this idea of how we approach people, we also have to approach people in humility to understand that we all have these hopes, dreams, and desires, and we don't know what to do with them, right? We know we want them fulfilled, but we know the person across from us just can't fulfill them. We shouldn't expect them to fulfill them. In fact, those expectations become frustrations in their life, and that's what creates the tension. And so before we said, before you take it to them, before I take this box to my spouse and say, here, this is yours, and I don't care how heavy it is, and all the background and garbage and mess that's in it because it makes sense to me even though it doesn't make sense to you regardless of this I'm not going to take it to them I'm going to take it to him first and say God you deal with these things and then what you might find happens with you and your spouse is that it's like well I used to think that this is how we dealt with conflict right but but not anymore you know I'm going to let that thing go and and I used to think that well there's some other things in here We'll toss that one to the side. <clears throat> I used to think, you know, pets and money. I had my ideas about money and what we were going to do with it. And, you know, maybe growing up you didn't, you didn't, you weren't around much money or it was like a big deal to have a little money. Or maybe you grew up, you know, affluent and wealthy and, and you had an idea and your spouse didn't. And it's like, I'm not going to let this control me or control our relationship. And, and it just goes on and on. And you'll find that God will begin to sort some things out. And you and this other person in humility coming to God draws you closer to the thing that you both want most. Your hopes, dreams, and desires begin to be shaped by God. They become His. And instead of being two temporary plans, they begin to mesh into the eternal plan of what God desires for you. And that's how things get better. That's how life gets better. Now... Say that to say this. Today what we're talking about is choices. We're talking about choices as we conclude and wrap up this whole thing. Choices are wonderful. Life is all about choices. And the good thing about choices is at the end of the day, you get to make the decision. You get to decide. Your choices are yours. Now, we can make choices that limit the rest of our choices and opportunities in life. Don't get me wrong on that. And I understand that. But your choice at the end of the day, and you're going to hear me say this a lot, is your choice to decide. You get to choose. And the wonderful thing about choices and the horrible thing about choices is we don't think much about them because we make choices every single day about every single thing in our lives. Every decision, every opportunity, every invitation, everything's a choice. How you respond, how you're going to act, left, right, right, wrong, right? Take, you know, one step in front of the other. You're going to get up, you're going to lay down. I mean, everything is a choice. Am I going to hit the snooze button or am I going to get up on time? Everything's a choice. And the thing about choices, then at the end of the day, because they're daily, we know this to be true, choices become habits, right? Because the more we choose something, we find this in psychology. And I used to love studying this in college about the human brain and and patterns of human behavior. And so we make choices every day that become habits, good or bad. And then those habits actually become patterns of our lives. And those patterns match the patterns of other people's lives. And because of that, then, what we learn, patterns are predictable. And that's a good thing. Patterns are predictable, and then predictability means that something can actually be prevented. Let's see that. So patterns are predictable, so your patterns and choices and habits are actually predictable patterns of human behavior. And because they're predictable, it means they're preventable, and that is really, really good news for all of us. And in fact, not only are they preventable, but some things are promotable, and you can promote good things while you prevent the bad things or the unhealthy things in life. And this really, truly is good news. Now, the way that we kind of get through this, though, is that choices have two sides to them, okay? And and we get to also decide this, how we use even our choices. Choices can either be reactive or proactive. Before a situation occurs, you can consider what's about to happen, and you can be proactive. Um, A good example of this is sports teams. Sports teams practice the very sport that they are going to perform in a tournament setting, don't they? Anybody in here athletes, right? You know this. We're about to launch the youth league baseball and and softball coming up here in just a little bit. And so we have times of practice. These kids get out on the field and practice the very game that they are going to perform in with other teams to compete. Why do we practice? Because we want to be proactive, right, in our, our athletes' ability to perform the task that they're given to perform. Or we could just be reactive and say, "Eh, forget practice, let's just show up to the games. Said no coach ever, right? But 
problem, though, what we find is that even though we get that in life, a lot of times we choose to be reactive in our choices. One of the greatest examples to me in Jesus' life of proactive choices is the Garden of Eden. Uh, well, excuse me, not the, well, yeah, Garden of Eden, but the Garden of Gethsemane. Because in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed a prayer that would take him on through the cross. Remember? He, in the garden, before he ever got to the cross, said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. Right? He settled the pain of the cross right there in the garden. And we know that from the fact that he sweat drops of blood. It was a very tense moment for him. But before he ever got to the cross, he settled that, Father, this is what I'm going to do. That is a proactive choice. And we all have the opportunity and the ability, if time is on our side, to make a proactive choice instead of rather being reactive. Now, a lot of times, though, what we find is we encounter things in life and we don't think we're given a choice because things tip us off balance emotionally and mentally, just like words. And we feel like, well, I don't even have a choice in this matter. It's already decided, right? And, and you've done this, so here's how I'm going to respond. But our response is just as important as the occurrence or what has happened in our lives. How we choose to respond can be a proactive choice or a reactive choice. And you get to decide. Every single time. Now, all that to be said, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians today. And we're going to talk about something that the Apostle Paul introduces to us. He, in fact, introduces us to a choice that you and I make on a daily basis, but we never consider it. We never really think about how we make the choice. Because the choice seems to, a lot of times, be made for us if we allow ourselves to just kind of go with the flow. And this particular chapter in 1 Corinthians, we have dubbed the love chapter, so you know where we're going. And I talked about this chapter a little bit in our last series, 1 Corinthians 13. We've dubbed it the love chapter, and we've made it into really good wedding literature. But if you really want the context of what Paul is addressing with the 1 Corinthian believers, and the Corinthian believers that we find in 1 Corinthians, in the first century, it's not really good marriage literature, okay? I mean, that's not what it's intended for. But in fact, it's addressing something very, very, very serious with this culture of people. You have to understand who Paul is talking to, and sometimes it's people just like you and me. These first century Christians in Corinth were Gentile Christians. They were not Jewish Christians. That's the first thing we need to understand about it. Gentile Christians without the background of Jewish history, okay? Gentile Christians, but they were former pagans, formerly following pagan religions, especially in the city of Corinth where the temple of Aphrodite existed. Now, let me give you some context. Corinthian men were well known to worship at the temple of Aphrodite, who is, hap, happens to be the goddess of love, right? <clears throat> and in this temple, there were priestesses, women and men and priests, who would engage in unbecoming activity as a form of worship. You understand where I'm going with this, right? We've got kids in the room. And so it was common for men to say, hey, I'm going to the temple to worship. I bet you are, right? Sure you are. Well, this is how we make the gods happy. We have to sacrifice, and and this is what the priests and the priestesses say. So it was very, very commonplace. And, And this, again, we consider this a pagan religion. And so people were used to this. But then when they turned to Christ, when they were introduced to the gospel, something totally different was introduced to their life. And and the question that that they were trying to seek when they were pagan followers or when when they became Christian is the same question, how do we please God? That's the question. How do we please God? And what they thought is if I go to the temple and perform my righteous acts of sacrifice to the priests and priestesses, then Aphrodite is going to be happy with me and my marriage is going to get better because she's the goddess of love. And this type of practice was followed with a lot of other of the gods and goddesses in this particular religion here that we find in Corinth, which was heavily influenced by Greek and Roman culture. How do we please God? And so Paul begins to speak into their lives something totally different. And as he's sitting, talking to these crowds, I'm sure in the distance he could just point and say, you guys used to live like this. But you don't live like this anymore. This is not where you need to be. You worship a God now who cares about you. In pagan religions, gods didn't care about people. They toyed with people. They toyed with humanity. 
And they desired in their legends and their folklore for humans to sacrifice to them in such a way that it would, it would give to them. But they didn't care what the humans received in return, really. Sometimes they were deceptive. They would lie to humans. And it was just a really tough religion to follow. But the question still remained, how do we please God? And so when, as Paul's addressing this, they had viewed God through kind of this vertical relationship, this vertical religion. You know, it's like, okay, in order for me to please God, I need to do the things that pleases God. I need to make God happy. So that's why I'm going to sacrifice to this God. And if I make him happy enough, then because I've done X, Y, Z, then God will follow through. This God will follow through and my life will be better. My crops will grow. My marriage will be better. You know, I'll have children, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can just imagine all of the things that went into that. But then Paul introduces this kind of horizontal religion, this horizontal ethic, and he said, no, if you want to make God happy, it's not just about, you know, how you interact with God, but what God says is it's also about how you interact with people, the people to your left and the people to your right, the people that you're eyeball to eyeball to every single day, the people who cross your path. And so what we call this and what Jesus introduced this as part of our mission statement is you have to love God. We get that. You have to believe and have faith in God, believe that he exists. But you also have to love the people that God created and the people that God also loves. And this ethic was new. Because in a Roman world, it was dog eat dog. It was, you know, the golden rule was he who has the gold makes the rules. I mean, that's how it worked. And you weren't too concerned about other people. I mean, you can go back and read the history books, folks. It was a tough place to live. But Paul was introducing something brand new. In fact, for us, we're kind of like, well, as we read 1 Corinthians, we're like, well, duh. Isn't that how everybody's supposed to act? But for this group, as Paul introduces this ethic, maybe he saw it on their face. Or maybe as he was thinking about them, as he was teaching them, and then later wrote these letters, maybe he was thinking, I remember the looks on your face. It was like, huh? What do you mean love people? And how are we supposed to love people? And what does this look like? And then it makes sense. It's like, oh, 1 Corinthians 13, that makes sense. Paul's introducing to them what this horizontal religion and the way that we're supposed to interact with our brothers and sisters, the the ones that are closest to us, the ones that are like us. Here's how this works. And so you're familiar with this. Here's how Paul begins this whole thing. He's going to lead us to a choice in a moment. He says, if I speak... The language and the tongues of men or of angels. Now, this was commonplace, even in pagan religions, that people would speak these utterances, okay? And these utterances would be like trying to speak like the gods and try to gain the gods' favor. And you're familiar with this, even in our culture, some too. And and if it's of God, it's of God. If it's not, you know, and of course, in a pagan culture, it's something that these gods don't exist. Paul's trying to introduce them to that, that there's only one true God. And he says, if I speak the tongues of men or of angels, but I do not have love, whatever have love means, they don't really truly understand it yet. That's why he's teaching them, and maybe even for us, we don't get it. He says, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal, which I wish, again, that I would have had Alex out here with a cymbal and just crashing this cymbal while I try to speak. You think you're going to be able to hear me? You think you're going to be able to process anything that I'm saying if somebody's just over here, you know, banging on a gong or a cymbal? Of course not. And he says, this is what you sound like. This is what we are like, that, that our words, and they may be as eloquent as they may be. We could be the greatest speaker in the world. But if we do not have love, possess this love, then we're nothing more than just a clanging cymbal. Now, a good point to this and something we can kind of take away from this is fancy language does not equate to having love. And and this is a really good example for speakers and pastors and people in my position. Don't ever judge a pastor's life by how well or how eloquently they speak, okay? You want to know about me? Don't judge it by what you see on Sunday morning. Go talk to my wife. Go talk to my children. Go talk to those who are closest to me because that's how you're truly going to get to know me, not through the hours of preparation on a message, right, to deliver on Sunday morning. That, that's not how. Fancy language doesn't mean that I have love. You go ask my wife and she'll tell you whether or not I have love. The same thing is true for all of us. But then he continues, he says, if I have the gift of prophecy, I mean, this is a big deal, right, to prophesy, to see the future, to be able to know what's coming, and I can fathom all mysteries. I mean, listen, I'm the smartest guy in the room, right? Or I have this, all the knowledge. I mean, I can fathom all of it. And if I have a faith that can even move mountains, to which we go, ooh, wait a minute. I thought faith, that's like the key to everything, right? You have such conviction and such belief. I mean, you have faith that can move mountains. That's what we're looking for. That's what the disciples were looking for from Jesus, too, if you remember. But Paul says, if you have even all this, but you don't have love within you, it's just a faith for your own good. 
It's just a faith so that you get to succeed or you get to have like you have been with these other gods. You're just, you're just giving all this faith and you're making things happen just so that you can get in return. He's like, look, this is nothing. If I don't have love, then I, he says, am nothing. I'm empty. And so we learn knowledge it does not equate having love. Fancy language does not equate having love. And he continues. He says, also, if I possess, if I give all that I possess to the poor, I mean, look at me, right? I'm generous and I sacrifice and I give over my body to hardship that I may boast because it's going to look good for me and I can tell people about what I've done. But if I do not have love, then I gain nothing. If you give to get in return, then you gain nothing, right? But again, here's what it means. Even self-sacrifice doesn't equate to having love. So fancy language doesn't get you there to have love. We know that uh, offering you know, of ourself and self-sacrifice does not get you there to have love. Having all the knowledge and being able to fathom mysteries does not mean that you have love. And so the audience, just like us, is like, well, what's this mean, have love? Because when you talk about having love, it seems like such an internal thing, doesn't it? It's like, I possess something. I have it within me. And, and what Paul's actually going to express to them is have love does not equate to something internal. It's not internal. Okay? Actually, that's a double negative. That should just say that, you know. Have love is not equal to being something that's internal. And in fact, that love is external. Paul expresses this. And so then you understand. Here's where he goes with it. And he, he begins by giving us some ideas of what love is. He says, love is patient. And I love that. That's probably my favorite one on the list. Because patience is me slowing down to the speed and, and, and you know, where somebody else is at. I'm all ramped up, ready to go, but they're not there yet, you know, and so it's like slowing down to kind of meet them where they are, to kind of keep pace with somebody else. And this is so important because in your relationships with other people, sometimes you're further ahead and, and, and you know, you got to slow down for other people, but sometimes other people are further ahead of you and you're the one in the back and you wish, you hope that they would just slow down and kind of meet you where you are because you might need some help, Right? And we all find ourselves in this, this, these different positions at times. Love is kind. That means, you know, you might have all the power and authority and leverage, and you might be right and they might be wrong, but you don't use any of that to hover over or, or to, to, to push down and put pressure on them. In fact, instead, you get down on their level. Kindness is like what you see how an adult reacts to a kid, right, to a child. They want to know something. You get on their level. You speak to them. That's kindness. That's how we do with, with the elderly sometimes, right? You know that maybe they can't hear well, and you, you're trying to address them. So you get closer, and you speak either softly or whatever tone you need to have. But you can't be yelling at them, right? You can't talk to them sometimes like you do your teenage children. It's not going to work. Love is kind. Love does not envy. It's like, I'm not envious of you. I'm not jealous of the things that you have and what you're doing and your accomplishments. And hey, I'm proud for you. I'm happy for you. I'm celebrating what's going on in your life. It does not boast. I'm going to give you the spotlight. So we're in a group of people and you're telling your story and the spotlight's on you and everybody's listening. I'm not going to try to one-up your story. That's what love says, okay? I'm not going to try to steal that, that light from you. Now, if we're all sharing, it might eventually get to me. But while you're doing your thing, I want to promote what you're doing. I don't want to be boastful about my life at the cost of somebody else, at the expense of them. And it is not proud. It's not self-seeking, as he's going to say. It doesn't think of itself higher than it should have or more than it should have. In fact, it has a lowly uh, perception of self, a humble perception of self. He continues, he says, it does not dishonor others, and this is huge. This is what you want every teenage boy and teenage girl uh, to, to encounter in their life. You want your teenage daughter to date teenage boys who choose not to dishonor them, right, who will protect them. To dishonor somebody is to sin against somebody, and for Christians, it's a no-go at any time. In fact, this is one of the three or four disses we have in my house. I say to my kids, don't diss me, right? That's a like 90s thing or 80s, late 80s, early 90s thing. Don't diss me. And they don't get it. They're like, what? <clears throat> they call it something else nowadays. I don't even know what it is. But, but, don't, but don't disrespect me. Don't be dishonest with me, right? Don't, be, don't dishonor your mother and, and, and talk back to her. Dishonor me and, and lie to me. This, these are the things that we talk about in our parenting and in, in our marriage. These are important. It does not dishonor. It's not self-seeking. 
It doesn't just look after itself. It's not easily angered. Some of you guys need to hear that one. Love is not easily angered. Why? Because it's patient and because it's kind, right? It is those things. It's not these things. It's not easily angered. And it keeps no record of wrongs. And we all want this. Nobody likes it when somebody keeps bringing up things from the past to remind us of our indiscretions, right? I'll I'll prove it to you. Does anybody really like it when another person remembers all your mess from the past and throws it in your face? Surprise, surprise, right? We know that's not loving. But man, we're quick to do it sometimes, aren't we? It's like, oh, yeah, I heard about that. I remember when. I remember when they did this. I remember when they did that. Love doesn't keep records of wrongs. Then Paul continues. He says something we're going to come back to. It's kind of confusing in a way. He says that love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices in the truth. And we're going to give some backbone to that in just a little bit. But then he continues past this, and he gives us a shotgun approach to love. Just boom, 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 right? But I looked at it and thought, what a progression that this is. Here's what Paul says. He says, it, love, always protects, say this with me, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres, to which we look at this list of always, and we're like, I don't think it always does those things, right? At least that's not what I've experienced, that it always protects. I mean, I've, there's been times that I felt like people didn't protect me. There's been times I felt like I couldn't trust or hope or persevere because, I mean, it just doesn't seem like always. But the problem with this list is really just one of these. Three out of the four of these is contingent upon you totally. Always protects is your choice. You're like, hey, even if something's going wrong, I can always protect. I can always be in that mode of protection, right? And you get to choose that regardless of the circumstances. Always hopes is like, again, regardless of what's going on, I can choose to always hope, to always have hope. That's just, that resides with me. And then the last one, to always persevere, is, yeah, I mean, I can choose whether I want to give up or I want to keep going. That's really all about me and circumstances that are happening, but, but I get to choose that. But the one that stands out to me, the one that I, I have problems with at times and complications with, I'll just be honest, is this one. Always trust, because that's not just contingent upon you. What are you trusting? Somebody else or some other circumstance that you can't control? In love? Always trust, that seems so naive. That seems so flippant. I mean, that that just seems like you are being, you know, really, um, what's that? Vulnerable. Great word. You're being so flippant with your life. I mean, you're just naive. You trust all things. In fact, the other translation of this that I grew up with, it stated it like this. Always trust was actually believes all things. That's even worse. Right? It's like always trust, that's one thing. But then when you really tease it out what the Greek explanation is, that you believe all things, well, how is that possible? So here's essentially, I believe, what Paul's saying after teasing this out and studying this quite a bit. What we learn about this is that love always defaults to trust. Love should always default to to trust. Now, you know what default means, right? Default is an action that happens without anything, uh, no, no processes having to infringe upon it. It's like, this is what's going to happen, you know, 100 times out of 100 times is just by default. This is what's going to happen. Default means the common response to a situation, okay? And it's already preset. In fact, there are buttons on your computer that says default. There used to be anyway, not anymore. The default button. It's like you hit the default button. That's going to perform an action over and over and over again that's the same. Every single one of us have a default button, a, a, an action, a response to things that we have built over time and, and that we choose to do this every time this thing happens. It's kind of like fight or flight you know, it's by default, it's within you. You're either gonna be a fighter or you're gonna be a flyer when something happens. Something spooks you, you either take off running or you start, you know, throwing fists, right? That's a default action within you. And the thing about relationships, as we learn about this, love defaults to trust, is this. Eventually, because none of us are perfect, in every relationship, eventually, there is going to be a gap. There's going to be a gap between the expectations that we have and things that, like we've talked about and what you actually experience. So she said she was going to do this, but then she did that, okay? And in the middle is this big question mark and the unknown. Now, I want to make sure that you understand this as I'm approaching this. 
When there's a gap between what you expect and what you experience, and you know what happened, I'm not talking about that, okay? That's not what we're discussing here. If you know what's going on, concrete evidence, that's a totally different thing, and you got to address the problem, right? I'm talking about when there's a gap and there's an unknown. They said they were going to do this, but they did this, and, and I don't know why, and it's leaving me with this huge tension, this huge gap. And in that moment, right there is where the choice comes in. And you get this choice a lot, just about every day. What we fill this unknown space with ultimately is your choice. When you don't have the concrete evidence of what's going on, your choice is what fills the gap. And what we fill this gap with are two things, okay? There's two options here, and we'll tease this out a second. You'll either fill this gap between expectations and experiences, what you've actually lived out, with trust or you'll fill it with suspicion. Trust or suspicion. I'm going to trust in their character and who they are and what they said. And they didn't do it, but I'm going to trust. Or I'm going to be suspect of their motives and their actions of why they didn't do the thing that they said they were going to do. Trust and suspicion. Here's how when you tease it out, here's how it looks. If we're going to fill it with suspicion, then this is what you find people typically do. They will assume the worst you ever met anybody like that? There's an unknown, and we immediately fly to assuming the worst possible situation has happened. Well, you know why they didn't do what they were said they were going to do. You can never trust them. You know, they're not worth it. And you just go on and on and on. We talked about communication, though. And what would happen, let me ask you a question just to kind of lead you into this. What would happen if people actually started listening to the words you use, even the words you use behind their back, which you shouldn't, what would happen if people started listening to the words you use, believing those words, and behaving according to those words? Would people be benefited or would they be burdened by your words? And when we assume the worst, we begin to speak things into existence that we know nothing about. We begin to speak death into a relationship right there from the onset because we're going to assume the worst about the situation. We don't know what happened, but our default, we're going to assume the worst. But then on the other hand, if you choose to fill this gap with trust, and love always trusts, love defaults to trust, instead of assuming the worst, you're going to believe the best. And now we sometimes call this pessimism and optimism, right? It's like, oh, you're just a pessimist, or oh, you're just an optimist. But no, this is a default for many of us, and it can come from a lot of factors in our lives. We're going to choose to believe the best. Hey, he didn't do what he said he was going to do. He said he would be there at 5, but he didn't get there you know, until 6 o'clock. I've been waiting. You know, what's going on? And, and, but I'm going to choose to believe the best. I'm going to choose that you know, he stopped to help somebody cross the road because they, you know, little old ladies crossing the road needing their groceries carried. Right? That's what he did. I'm just going to assume the best, and I'm going to go on. And you find these two decisions that, that we get to make. You get to fill in the gap. You get to choose. But the problem is with all of us, there's a tension most of the time when we experience something we didn't expect. And, and what that is, is it doesn't feel like a choice in the moment. It doesn't feel like a choice in the moment because a lot of us are programmed, we're by default reactive people rather than proactive people. We're reactive to a situation where we'll assume the worst rather than being proactive in a situation to kind of prepare ourselves for things. Trust causes us to be proactive about this. Reactive situations means the occurrence happens and then now you're going to choose how to respond, but you're choosing how to respond in the midst of emotion and when the temperature is super high and that is always a bad way to make decisions. You've been taught and I've been taught even from a young age. When we're upset and angry and we need to make a decision, what should we do? Stop and count to 10, right? Why? Because you need to cool down. Some of you are like, you know, that woo-saw thing. I don't know, rub your earlobes and... But you need to get away. You need to think about it. Most of us, we need to pray right in that moment because we don't want to make a decision out of, out of the anger that we feel. That would be sinful. Now, let me give you some evidence of this. Paul's talking about this. He's the one who's bringing this up. Love always trusts. But some now 2,000 years later, there's been some studies that have done here recently. And, uh, <clears throat> and I, I'm, the Gatton Academy, not Gatton Academy, the... Uh, Anyway, I, I, if I can remember it, it's on top of my, or tip of my tongue. Uh, a study was done, it was about the, the happiness of couples. And it was looking at couples over a course of 20 years. 
And uh, this, this particular study, 20-year study of happy couples, they were wanting to know why couples who had been married 20 years plus and who had like lived out the longevity of their relationship, even after 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, they still liked each other, right? Like they wanted to be in the same room with each other. They were trying to figure out if there was a common denominator. And what they actually assumed in this study, you can see it here and put it on the screen, the assumption was that the way these couples stayed married for so long and still liked each other at the end is that over time the couples had actually lowered their expectation. It was like, well, we just kind of put up with each other. You know, I've just kind of learned that I can't expect much from him, can't expect much from her, and if I just leave my expectations behind, we seem to get along a whole lot better. That's pretty sad, right? That was the assumption, and I can totally understand that because, again, we're all imperfect people, right? But what they actually found was the opposite. And how cool this is, is that the very same thing that Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians has been proved through studies even in recent, just in the past you know, five to eight years. Here was the conclusion, actually, what they found. Happy couples were generous with their interpretation of their spouse. It's like, well, I know that he don't have it all together, but I still know that his intentions are good. I'm going to believe the best about my spouse. Well, I know that she doesn't have it all together, but listen, but, she's, but I know she loves me, and she wouldn't hurt me. They had generous interpretations of their spouse. In fact, they ranked each other. Get that. This is interesting. They ranked their spouse and themselves in how their conduct was and how they, they managed you know, their relationship. And the happier couples here ranked their spouse higher than themselves. They had an exaggerated view of, of their spouse in a good way. And they found that it's like, was that ignorance is bliss? Maybe so. I don't know. But you're choosing it, right? It's not ignorance. It's a choice to believe the best. And it seems to be the blissful choice. In fact, what they called this is MGI, the most generous interpretation. People who are generous with their interpretations of others' intentions live happier and more fulfilled lives. What did I say there? Live happier and more fulfilled yeah, lives. And, and this is... Predictive. This is exactly what Paul's saying. Love always trusts, right? And then as we look at this in a minute, you're going to see how this plays out. But one of the other things they found in this is that as they trusted, as they had generous interpretations of each other's intentions, here's what it led to, what they called an upward spiral of love. Now, this is psychologists talking about this. An upward spiral of love. Check this out. <clears throat> in the upward spiral of love, they said the illusion, the exaggerated interpretation of their spouse's intentions actually created conviction. What are we talking about here? Believing the best. They chose to be generous with their interpretation and believe their choice. That's pretty powerful. That's pretty impactful. That conviction led to security because I believe this about them. I feel safe with them and I feel secure and protected of our relationship. And then that security fostered intimacy because they felt safe and close and you will never give yourself fully over to someone that you do not feel a sense of safety with. Now there's intimacy and the intimacy cultivated eventually love and they said then this curled right back around. Again, it's a spiral upward. It spiraled right back around to the illusion because the love fostered the illusion. And it kept going, and it kept going, and it kept going. I thought, that's just the coolest thing ever, that they found this. The exact same thing that the Apostle Paul is trying to get us to understand 2,000 years ago. So here's my advice, free marriage advice. Choose the most generous interpretation for each other's behavior and believe it. It's like, well, how am I supposed to believe it? You just do. You choose to believe it. Now, there are obstacles to this, and I'm not naive, and neither are you. There are obstacles to this because it's tough to just believe all things, especially it can depend on how we were raised, the things we experienced. In fact, these obstacles are all about us. It's what we have experienced in the past, and it's who we have become as people. And this gets in the way. I mean, this right here, right? Me. I get in the way of myself, and you do the same. And all throughout the New Testament, that's the teachings of Jesus, that's the teachings of Paul, James, we could go on and on. Get out of your own way and move towards Christ. Get in with Jesus because he is the way. We become our own obstacle in this. So here's the thing. 
Any time that there's a gap, and eventually there's going to be a gap between what you expect and your experience, you get to choose. And you don't get to blame this on anybody else. And you don't get. To, and I heard a guy telling me this this week. You don't get to play the victim in this either. What you've experienced and who you are, those two things are not the motivating and driving factor. You get to choose every single time. And you get to choose to be reactive or proactive. Now, let me give you the negative on this real quick, and then we'll wrap this up. If you choose suspicion, please understand that suspicion works like a self-fulfilling prophecy. You will eventually find proof and evidence to prove your suspicion. If you choose to place in that gap to assume the worst and to be suspect of people, you will actually set the tone and create the environment. You will set the stage for that person to fail in the exact way that you are suspecting them to. This is another part of psychology that we learn. I remember there were some teenagers that as I was becoming a young adult, these teenagers would talk about their parents and their parents would always accuse them of doing things that they didn't do. And one day out of the mouth of the teenager said, you know, I'm thinking about just starting to do the things that you accuse me, or you're accusing me of doing because you're gonna accuse me of it anyway. I might as well get to enjoy it. You can actually create the environment. You can set the stage for a young person or for your spouse to begin to think things about themselves and about the relationship. Now, it's their choice. Don't get me wrong. But we can cultivate that. Suspicion is a self-fulfilling prophecy. And what's the, what's the opposite of this? What, what's the evidence or the advice that we're going to give to our children when it comes to this? When it comes to their marriage. Let's look at a list of these things. Let's say we're going to tell our kids, you need to assume the worst and always be protective of your relationship, right? You need to protect your heart at all costs. You need to delight in catching people doing wrong because that's what it is. I'm going to suspect this is what you're doing and I can't wait to catch you. And we know that's not healthy. We're going to thrive on speculation. We don't know the answer, but we're going to thrive on the speculation. We're going to make up stories. We're going to make up ideas. And we're going to embrace our doubts. So you guys have a great marriage, right? Is that what we're going to say? Is that how we're going to do this? We know that's not true. That's not right. So quickly, let's jump back into the scripture for a minute and look at why Paul addresses and why, why he says the things he says. Here, here we go, 13.6. Love does not delight in evil. Love isn't trying to catch you doing something wrong. Love is believing the best and hoping that you're doing right and is heartbroken when there's wrong is crushed when there's wrong because it's going to impact your heart. It's going to impact your relationship. Love doesn't delight in evil, but it rejoices with the truth. It seeks truth and it trusts. It believes the best and it, it wants the truth to be good, right? It wants the, your truth to be good. And so then he gives us the shotgun approach again. It, love, always protects. And if it protects, think about it. If it protects, go on with that, then it will trust because I feel protected and therefore I can trust. This is our own spiral, if you will. And he says, if you're trusting, then you can always hope. I mean, you're given reason to hope. And if you're hoping, you will persevere. You will push on and you will move through any obstacle that you face. This is a progression deeper and deeper and deeper into the relationship. So let me ask you a question and then we'll, we'll get this closed. When there's a gap, do you assume the worst or do you believe the best? Who are you? When there's a gap, do you assume the worst or do you believe the best? And if you don't know, ask your spouse. They'll tell you, okay? Another piece of marital advice there. Do you assume the worst or do you believe the best? And as Paul talks about this, okay, and as we look at this, I need you to understand something. We've looked at the negative, but let me tell you what the results is, are, are of the positive. If we choose to follow love that, let's look at what he says, always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres, Paul gives us one more thing that love always does, and this is incredible, and this is for you, and you need to hear this, some of you, because you don't believe this, I don't think. We need to hear this. Say it with me out loud, these three words, love never fails. Paul says in the conclusion of this, love will never fail you. It will never fail you. The outcome of love will lead you to your heavenly father and ultimately to the eternal plan of God in your life. And that may mean that the situation and circumstance that you're in is not resolved and there's still tension and there's still problems. And Jesus said, hey, in this world you're going to have trouble. And sometimes the trouble's you. You're the common denominator of everywhere you go, there you are. Get out of your way and begin to foster this belief, believe the best, choose to believe the best, choose to trust. 
And if you say, well, I, they've proven that I can't trust them. And I've had evidence over and over and over that I can't trust them and I can't trust these situations or I can't trust this environment, then let me give you one better. Then choose to trust in Jesus because he'll never fail you. In fact, I like what, what Paul says to Timothy and we'll end with this. Paul had an accurate, uh, an accurate view of himself and I think we all ought to have this view. And if we did, I think our expectations would be a lot less on other people. We would stop projecting so much. Here's what he says. Here is a trustworthy saying. You can trust this. This is truth. That deserves full acceptance. You don't want to accept it, but you need to. And so do I. Christ Jesus came into the world to save who? Who? And let's just say this together because this is the truth. Of whom I am the worst. There's no need to assume the worst. I can assume it right here. But in fact, I'm going to choose to believe the best and I'm going to believe the best about you because I'm the worst person you know. And if we all took that approach, folks, that could be a game changer for our marriages, for our relationships, for Christianity in this world at all. A clear view of who we are. So here's my advice as we go and I'm going to wrap it up. Choose the most generous interpretations for each other's behavior and do what? Believe it. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Let me pray for you. Father, we love you and we thank you. And we're just going to leave this here to settle for all of us as we conclude this series. That you've given us so much advice on how to live and it all comes down to love. And love always trusts. When there's a gap in what we experience from what we expect, we get to choose what we put in this gap. And a lot of times it doesn't feel like a choice. It feels like they've already made the choice for us. I mean, we know how bad they've lied. We know how bad they've cheated. We know how far they've gone. We know how far they've betrayed. We know how far their heart is from us. But, but God, in this moment when there is a gap and there are unknowns, help us to fill that gap by default with believing the best. Because as you looked into humanity, as you looked into the hearts of, of mankind, you chose to believe the best about us in providing your Savior that we had worth because of you, because you made us, because we are your creation. And we hope, Father, that you never look at us and just assume the worst. And I hope, Father, that we never do that to others. But that we'll believe the best because we are called to love the very people that you created and the people that you love. The people that you sent your son for to give them an opportunity to find life. You sent your son, Jesus, to die for sinners. And every single one of us could admit that we are the worst ones that we know. And with that view in mind, Father, would you, through your word, give us the wisdom to know the right thing to do? And give us the humility to want to do this right thing, to love people beyond themselves. And Father, at the end of the day, give us the strength and the courage through your spirit to get that good thing done for the benefit of your kingdom and the benefit of the people around us and their hearts and minds, their souls that are eternal. And Father, we know they're either going to spend eternity with you or they're going to spend eternity away from you. And it ought to break our hearts to know that the people that we love in our lives and people that we don't even know, but the people that you love would not get to spend eternity with you because of their sin when you already made a way. So help us not be a church that presents obstacles to this world, but instead builds bridges, that, that builds on ramps to this narrow path of Christ that brings salvation. We love you, Father, and we pray for our marriages. We pray for our relationships and for our church. And everybody said... Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for being here today. Next week, we'll start a brand new series. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, and God bless you and your marriages, and we'll see you again next week. Have a great day.